I'm so grateful to be here with you this week. Um, I, I hope to get to know you a, a little bit more and a little bit better. I hope that the lessons that are presented are in truth. Uh, I hope that they are beneficial and helpful for everyone who is here. I want to encourage you, though, that um, you know, we have this kind of tradition at the end where we offer an invitation, and I try to let people know if you want to become a child of God, if you, want, if you have sin that you, you have on your heart that you want to get out, you, you interrupt me. You raise your hand. You come forward. We'll take care of that. I can always start over. I've got notes. I'll mark down where I was, and we'll pick up uh, you know, after you're baptized or, or if you've got sin that you, you would like to repent of. You come forward at any time. You raise your hand. You, you know, don't feel like you're going to be rude. That's, that's the most important thing. That's why we're here. Uh, and so throughout this week, uh, I encourage you that if that's on your heart, uh, you take care of that first. I meant to mention this morning, uh, typically, unless I, I say otherwise, I use the New American Standard uh, Bible to, to preach from or to read from. Uh, and so uh, I encourage you to follow along uh, in whatever translation you have. But if you have multiples on your uh, phone or on your tablet or whatever, that's, that's the one that I will typically be reading from throughout the week. Let's turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. 2 Chronicles chapter 34. I want to start in verse 14. When they were bringing out the money which had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah responded instead to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan brought the book to the king and reported further word, saying to the king, Everything was entrusted to your servants they are doing. They have also emptied out the money which was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hands of the supervisors and the workmen. Moreover, Shaphan, the scribe, told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest gave me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. And it came about when the king heard the words of the law that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikim, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of this book which have been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord which is poured out on us because our fathers have not observed the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. We talked a little bit this morning about the series of lessons is going to deal with things that we've lost, and, and we're going to, again, just kind of build from losing that foundation to if we've lost the book, if we have lost God's word, if we've lost our Bible, then we have lost God's foundation because that's where he gives us that foundation. I, I love this account uh, that we're reading uh, in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, it, and it reminds me, I don't, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever done this or not, but there have been several times where my sister and I will watch my mother, and we don't know how long to do it, but we will watch my mother search for her glasses on top of her head, right? <laughs> Sitting on top of her head, and we'll watch, and she'll say, I can't find my glasses anywhere. And my sister and I would just kind of look at each other and say, how long, should we, how long should we let this go? When should we tell her that her glasses are on her head? We can see them, but the process is fun, right? To, to watch somebody look for something that is, that is just in plain sight. Have you ever found your keys in your pocket? You know, you're looking all over for your keys, and all of a sudden, you know, there's that jingle in your pocket, and you, you find them where they were supposed to be anyway, right? You find your glasses on your head where they're supposed to be anyway. Imagine if I would have come in here this morning, and I gathered the elders together, and I said, listen... Guys, I was here a little bit early this morning, and I found this neat little book. You have some of them in your pews. I found this neat little book. It's called the Bible. You know what? I think I might read from that this morning. I think the response from the elders probably would have been, Tony, it's been good to have you here this morning. However, I think Lewis will take over, or Joel will take over this morning, and, and you, you just you sit and listen and see if you can't learn something today. Right? This is where, where else would you find the book? Right? This is, this is where we come to meet and we come to worship. Where else would that book be? Well, here Hilkiah, the high priest, finds the book of the law in the temple. Where else would it be? Right? 
That's where it's supposed to be. That's where they're supposed to be reading from that book. Hezekiah was a good king. Right? And, and, and we, we look up in the context in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, and in and, and about verse 3, we find in the eighth year, he began purging Israel. Now, he hasn't even found the book yet, but he knows enough about the book. He knows enough about God's word that he begins purging all of the things that his father and his grandfather, especially Manasseh, has put in that temple. And so he begins purging those things and taking those idols and taking those things out that weren't supposed to be in there. And then in the 18th year, he begins repairs on it. That really has been about 75 years since we've read anything about these uh, things taking place. We find that his great great grandfather Hezekiah did a lot of those things, but then Manasseh and Ammon. Let all of these things go. And we find Josiah trying to bring some of these things back where they're supposed to be anyway. This thing has been lost for 75 or 80 years since the time of Hezekiah. And this is what ends up happening if we do this. If you look at 2 Kings chapter 21... And again, Hezekiah is an interesting uh, account as well because he was a really good king up until the last 15 years, really, that God added to his life. And within that time period, he has his son Manasseh, who at 12 years old eventually becomes king in 2 Kings 21, starting in verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, became king and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hesba. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. According to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel, for he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he erected altars for Baal, and made an Asherah, and as Ahab king of Israel had done, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. For he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord, and he made his sons pass through the fire practiced witchcraft, used divination, and dealt with mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Then he set carved image of Asherah that he had made in the house of the Lord, which said to David and his son Solomon, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will not make the feet of Israel wander any more from the land which I gave their fathers. If... Only they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they did not listen. And Manasseh seduced them to do evil more than all the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. That, this is what happens when we lose the book. That's why I believe in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, we get Josiah's reaction starting in verse 19. And it came about when the king heard the words of the law that he tore his clothes. Again, if you, you do a little bit of study on and what that means, he's upset. right? He's tearing his clothes as a sign of him being upset. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that's why you get, he's scared. He's scared because they're not doing what God wants them to do. And he's reading in this book how a terrible thing it is to not do what God wants them to do. And so prior to this, they really only knew of that book. I'm sure that they know it existed. We see that Josiah is making some of these changes already. Uh, that even before he gets the book of the law, he knows well enough that, that these things are not supposed to be in the temple. And so he becomes frightened when these verses are being read, when these things are being read that, that Moses spoke to them so long ago. I think there are times when we lose the book, but we lose it in places that it should never be lost. It's, you know, you lose the book of the law in the temple. You know, okay, I understand if, you know, if you're traveling and you, you leave it somewhere, right? 
Yeah, I get that, but it's, it's in the temple. It's where it's supposed to be. How do you lose it in that place? And I think there are times when we today lose God's word in places it should never be lost. And we need to make sure that we're doing our best that we don't lose it in these places. And I've, I've got three that I want to talk to you about this morning. You'll notice that most of my sermons, if not all of them, have three points. So if you're, you're keeping score, keeping track, um, that's what I did when I was playing basketball. I shot a lot of three-pointers, so I just kind of carried that over into my lessons and, and try to use those, those three points uh, as we move forward. I, I think there are times when we lose God's Word in the pulpit. You know, there, it saddens me and maybe even sickens me. There are, there are people all over this world that are going to worship but aren't hearing God's Word. This very morning, maybe even in this very town, city, Talmadge, I'm not sure how, how many people there are, I don't know if it's considered a, uh, you know, a city or not, but in, in this very place, there are people going to worship today that may not get to hear God. They're, they're going to worship God, but they may not get to hear anything about God or His Word. Some of them may not even want it. They may be coming just to make themselves feel better, but they don't really want to hear God's Word. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, notice what Paul says to Timothy starting in verse 1. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Right? Preach the word. The word has already been given. You know, if I had to come up with this stuff on my own, I probably wouldn't be very good at it. But the word has been given to us. And so God says, Tony, just, just, just preach out of what's in here. This is what I want these people to know. And so again, I may tell you some stories or give you some analogies that are supposed to help, help understand what God wants you to know. But really, just listen to God. Listen to what God is telling you. Listen to His Word. And so Paul tells Timothy, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Do you realize that I've heard of, of, of preachers, brothers in Christ, that have been asked to leave places because they're preaching the truth? And the people don't want to hear it anymore. That's sad. And it happens all over the world. Well, as long as you're not stepping on my toes, you're okay. But the minute you hit those, the minute you hit my toes, you're out. Paul says, don't let people do that to you. Preach the word. And he tells them, there's going to come a point in time when people aren't going to want to hear it. But you still need to preach that word. It can be difficult to do at times. And you may say, well, but Tony, you're, you're preaching. <laughs> it, you're up there. So you need, you need to do that. You need... Understand that you have a job in all of this too. You need to make sure that whoever is up here, whether it's myself, whether it's Joel, you need to make sure that what is being taught from this pulpit is truth, is the Word of God, is what God wants you to know and wants you to hear. I've always said, and, and, and I've heard Vernon T. Garden say this many, many times. I, when I was a young man, attended Barnesville, he, he was preaching there uh, at Barnesville uh, for a few years. And I, and I heard him say this over and over. He would say, I, I could make a lot of money doing this if I wanted to. Right? You'd have to go away from truth. But how many times do you turn on a TV and you hear one of those TV evangelists say, you need to send more money because God tells me that I need a jet. Right? I need a jet to go around and, and preach all of these places I'm preaching, so you need to send me more money so I can have a jet. I've been looking, but it's not in there. Yes, there are times where people can make a lot of money preaching, but not preaching the truth. It's not going to happen that way. 
I've always said we, we have one of the most difficult jobs as far as preachers are concerned, and not necessarily because you know it's just difficult to, to preach or anything like that, but hopefully your audience knows a little bit about God's Word. That's why it makes it difficult. I hope that you know God's Word well enough to know whether I'm telling you the truth or not. And it makes it hard, it makes it difficult, but we're losing God's Word even in places like this. And understand that it is absolutely a matter of life and death. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul again tells Timothy, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. We need to be mindful to preach the truth because it is a matter of life and death. He says you're going to assure salvation for yourself and for the people that hear you. And if we do it right, if we do it the right way, God will get the glory 100% of the time. And again, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, he says, Whoever speaks, let him speak as it were the utterances of God or the oracles of God. Whoever serves, let him do it as by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He said, if you do it right, God gets the glory all the time. And that's what's supposed to happen in the pulpit. But that's not always what happens. And again, I understand that there are going to be times when, well, I prefer this style over this style. And I, yeah, I get that. But he says, if it's done right, if truth is preached, then God gets the glory all the time. And it doesn't matter who's teaching it or who's preaching it. As long as it's truth and God gets the glory. And so I'll try to do my part this week. And I'm sure Joel and I have just met him. But it seems like a guy that's going to try to do that same thing. He's going to try to preach the truth and do his part. I'll try to preach the truth and do my part, but you have to do yours too. Follow along. Make sure that the things that you're being told are truth so that you can go out and teach and preach to other people. Let's not lose the book in the pulpit. This is where we need to have it all the time. The next place that I want to talk about us losing the book is in the home. It's being lost so many times in homes. And we may come and we may get the gospel of Jesus Christ here, but does that gospel continue to go when we get home and our doors are closed and no one else is there? How many times do people go home and they're different than what they are when they're here, when they're around other people? We hear of, of fathers who abuse you know, their children or abuse their wife but yet will sit in a, a pew and just seem like the, the greatest guy while, while he's sitting in the pew or while he's even up in the pulpit. But yet he loses that book when he gets home. Keeping the book in the home is not enough. It needs to be used. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, again, Paul tells Timothy in verse 5, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it dwells in you as well. I like to take the time at, at, at this point when I'm talking about this verse to say if we do keep the book in the home that it's going to last from generation to generation to generation. Case in point, if somebody asked me, Tony, how did you ever become a preacher? How did you get where you are? Was your father a preacher? Well, Sadly, I have to tell you that my father is not even a Christian, still to this day. So no, it wasn't that my father was a preacher or, or that my grandfather was a, a preacher. Or, I didn't follow that path. I have a different path. My great aunt Vess, I like to refer to her as, as the matriarch of our family as far as religious practices and beliefs go. She was the first to become a child of God in our family. And I can remember in her latter years, she would sit and she loved to sing. And she was one who, she had a husband that just didn't treat her very well and tried to kill her one night and slit her throat. She made it, but she lost her voice in the process. But even on song night, you could just see her sitting there and she wanted to sing. 
She couldn't hear it. She couldn't get it out. But she would just smile because she was so happy to be there and to hear other people singing and praising God. She's a strong woman. She taught my grandmother the gospel, who just passed away last year, a little over a year ago. She taught her the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there's number one and number two. Number three is my mother. I watched her drag two kids, me being one of them, in the building every time the doors were open. Right, even if we came kicking and screaming, and I hear stories, I don't remember, it wasn't in high school like some people would like to tell the story, but they can remember my mom dragging me up front. The classrooms were up by the pulpit, and, and so they remember me being drug, kicking and screaming, because I didn't want to leave my mom, kicking and screaming, and she would put me in the, the door and, and walk away she would go. That's influence. My sister, who's two years, three months, and one day older than me, she liked to always remind me of that when we were growing up. So now I like to remind her that she's two years, three months, and one day older than me. I walked into my biology class my freshman year in high school, and my biology teacher met me at the door. I was scared to death. I would not have said a word. But he said, listen, I get it. You don't believe in evolution. Okay, here's, I'm going to give you the same thing that I gave your sister. I didn't have to say a word. My sister, who was a very good influence over me during those high, tough high school years, had already set the bar. She'd already set the precedent, and he did not want to mess with me, and I wouldn't have said a word. I would not have said, I was too scared to say anything. But she wasn't. Good influence on me. And then I married a Christian, my wife. If you ask me who the top five Christian influences are on me and why I'm standing here, the first five will be women. So don't think, ladies, that you cannot have an impact on someone else because you can. And then maybe it's number six. I might start talking about some men. Maybe not. There are some, plenty of other women that, that are the reason why I'm up here. And I may tell some of those stories throughout, throughout the, the week. But don't think that it's not going to last. If you lose God's word in your home, then you've lost a generation. Right? But if that, if that sticks, if that stays, look at what can happen generation after generation after generation. I didn't follow the, maybe the normal path to preaching that other people have. But it doesn't mean I didn't have influence. It doesn't mean that... Mom didn't allow us to lose this book in our home. And I hope and pray that I can teach my children the same things. I know we, we say this, you know, I, I'm, I'll, never, I'll never say that to my kids, Mom. You're so mean. And, but, you know, I've seen my mom's finger come out of my hand a time or two with my own kids. I say, oh, where, where did that come from? Right? It's planted. It's in there. And it's not as bad as I thought it was. Too many parents are concerned today about the popularity of their children. You know, I had a, a grandmother as I was expressing some concern about her grandson. I had a grandmother tell me once, oh, let, let boys be boys. Boys will be boys. He'll grow out of it eventually. He's just sowing his wild oats. You know what happens if you plant wild oats? You don't get apples, you don't get corn, you get wild oats. And that's typically what's going to happen. That phrase, we use that phrase to say, oh, they're just sowing their wild oats, meaning they're getting it out of their system. But what happens when you plant them? If you plant wild oats and you're getting those things out of your system, eventually you're, you're going to grow wild oats somewhere because that's all you're planting. So many parents are so concerned with the popularity of their children. They want them to be the best athlete that they can be. Right? They want them to be the best student they can be. And so they make sure that their homework is done. They make sure that they go out and practice their free throws you know, after practice. Because you don't want to miss those free throws again. Those are free points, right? So you don't, want to, you don't want to miss those. And so they have their children out and they're practicing free throws and they're doing their homework. All of those things are okay. Did you make sure that they got their Bible study lesson done for Sunday morning? Did you make sure that they got their Wednesday evening, they reviewed their Wednesday evening Bible study material so that they're ready and they're prepared for class. See, that's where we begin to lose it. 
What are we telling our kids? We're saying this is way more important than this. You make sure that you get your schoolwork done. You make sure that you, you practice as hard as you can practice. And then if you have time, then you can read your Bible. Then you can make sure that your lesson's done. What are we telling them is more important? Again, I'm not, I'm not saying I was an athlete, I'll, former athlete. I'll not say I'm an one now. I'm former <laughs> athlete. And so all those things were important to me too. But we need to make sure that we're not losing God's word in place of it. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, again, Paul tells Timothy, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which were able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Are we giving that to our children? Or are we saying, you can worry about that later? You can become a Christian later. You, you worry about this now. You, you become the athlete and get the scholarship or you study you know, so hard and get the scholarship. Again, I'm not saying any of those things are wrong. But a lot of times it happens in place of them studying God's word and reading God's word and knowing God's word. Are we allowing that? Our children know from childhood the sacred writings which are able to save their eternal souls. See, I'm, I'm almost 42, and I'm, I'm already able to admit I'm a former athlete. Right? It's going to go away. And a lot of you have already said, oh, you're still young. You're still young, but I can't do the things that I used to. You know, I used to be able to stand underneath of the rim and jump up and grab it with both hands. You think I could do that now? I probably wouldn't be able to climb up a ladder to get to it without my knees popping and hurting. Right? That goes away. But God's word is not going to go away. The physical things are going to go away. God's word is eternal. It's, those are the things that are going to last that we need to focus on and con concentrate on. You know, a lot of times as, as mothers and fathers and husbands and wives, we want to put the kids in their place, put the children in their place. But if you look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, I think it's talking to us as well as parents Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. What does that tell you, parents? Usually we throw this back at our kids, right? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. What does it tell you as a parent? Give your kids some instruction, right? Be the leader. Give them some instruction. Give them something to obey. How many kids have we seen that, that their parents obviously aren't giving them instruction when they go to the store? Right? We've seen those kids in the store. We've seen them out in public. They obviously don't have any instructions. Give them some instructions to obey. He tells children, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. You know, I used to translate that, honor your father and mother or she'll kill you. That, that's kind of how I, I used to translate that when I was a kid, but that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is your mom and dad have your best interest at heart. So when they tell you not to play in the street, when they tell you don't touch the hot stove, it's your interest they have at heart. They're not just, you know, keeping you from having fun. But what does that tell us when he says, honor your father and mother? Be honorable. Be someone that it's easy for your children to honor. Be that type of parent where your children want to honor you. They want to give you what is due to you. He says that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And then he says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Everyone, not just the children, moms, dads, husbands, wives, everyone has a place in the home. How often times, have, though, have we seen fathers giving up their spiritual leadership to mom willingly, right? Just because, because I don't want to do it, right? And we see that in the family dynamic changes. Does that mean that mom is not capable? No. A lot of times you'll see mom being the spiritual leader of the household because dad's just not doing it. And so she has to do it. She doesn't necessarily want to do it, but she, somebody has to do it. Somebody has to be that. Fathers, let's be that for our family. Be those spiritual leaders that God wants you to be and designed you to be. Play your God-given role in the family. And teach your children. Be honorable so that they can give you the honor that is due. And it's easy for them to do. And train them up 
in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and do not lose this book in your home. The final thing that I want us to look at this morning is that I believe way too often we lose God's word in emotion. Now, I'll go ahead and address the elephant in the room if you grew up in the 80s. Yes, I realize there is a song called Lost in Emotion by Lisa Lisa and the Cult Jam, 1987. I listened to it too. But it's, it's kind of the same thought that we're, we're, we're bringing up. Sometimes when emotion is involved, we lose everything else. You ever get so mad that you said something that you normally wouldn't say? Do you ever get so frustrated or sad that you say or do something that you normally wouldn't say? That's the idea of getting lost in emotion. Emotion has its place. Go back with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 34 where we began our context this morning. I want you to look at something. Again, remember Josiah's reaction in verse 19. And it came about when the king heard the words of the, of the law, he tore... His clothes. That's an emotional reaction, right? He was emotional at that point in time. He's upset. He's scared. And so he tears his clothes. Now, what I believe happens today is we have an emotional reaction to something. And then we allow that emotion to take over and say, okay, now what do I do? Right now? Where do I go? And so that's when you get things like we talked about this morning where, where, you know, with the homosexual community where they say, well, I'm happy. God wants me to be happy and this makes me happy. And so obviously God is okay with this. And, and that's their, their line of reasoning, right? Because it makes me happy and God wants me to be happy. Their line of reasoning is that this should be okay. But is that what God's word says? No, they're allowing their emotions to take over. Let's not say what God wants us to do. and what, Let's let God tell us what he wants us to do, how he wants us to worship. You know, God wants us to get people in this building so they can hear God's word. And so emotion tells us, well, if we serve free food, we'll bring more people in, right? It makes sense in our human minds. But is that what God wants? Because when we start doing things like that, or having sports teams, or whatever it is, however you draw people in from the outside, if we're not using God and His Word, we're saying, Jesus, Your Word is not good enough. It's not bringing people in the way that it should. We have a better idea. And that's letting emotions take over. Notice what Josiah does in verse 21. So we go from Josiah tearing his clothes, and then him saying in verse 21, Go... Inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book which has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord, which is poured out on us because our fathers have not observed the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. Yes, he has an emotional reaction and tears his clothes. But then he says, go find out what God wants us to do. And shouldn't that be our reaction any time? Any time we have emotion? Is it okay to be emotional while we're here and serving God? You better believe it. If, if you're not smiling when we're singing about heaven, you shouldn't be here, right? We, we should be happy when we sing about heaven unless you're singing about heaven and you're sad and you realize you might not make it. It's okay to cry when we read about Jesus and his sacrifice, it's okay to have emotion. But don't let that emotion lead you to a place that God would not want you to go. It's okay to smile. It's okay to cry. It's okay to have emotion while we're here. But let God decide where we go from there. Go inquire, what does he want me to do with this emotion that I have? Right? And so the word comes back to Josiah Start doing what God wants you to do. Start doing what you've been reading about in this book. And that's the word that comes back. That's what God wanted them to do. Not to change anything. Right? Peter sometimes got ahead of himself. Well, let, let's make an altar. Right? Sometimes Peter got ahead of himself. In Luke chapter 9, verse 28. Let's make an altar for not only you, but for Moses and Elijah. Right? 
And some eight days after the saying, it came about that he took Peter and John and James and went to the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of the face, his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, the two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who appearing in the glory were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now we get to Peter's reaction. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And it came about as they were parting uh, from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Right? He's having an emotional reaction right now. Master, it is good for us to be here. But Peter allows that emotion to take over, and he says, Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. He let emotion get ahead of him. And he said, hey, this would be a great idea, right? We see you, we see Moses, we see Elijah. Let's make a tabernacle for all three of you while we're here. He had emotion, but then Peter tried to decide what was going to be done with that emotion. And notice what was told of him. And while he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son, my chosen one. Listen to Him. Not Moses. Not Elijah. Listen to my Son. There's no need for three tabernacles. Because you're only listening to one of them. Just listen to Jesus. Just listen to what He tells you. And do that. Don't try to come up with it on your own. Just listen to Him. Let's not lose God's word in emotion, even though it's okay to be emotional and have emotion. It's okay for us to have emotion while we're worshiping God. Just don't let that emotion move you to, to do something that God would not approve of. We need to continue to find this book and find it. It's not enough just to have it, but we need to follow it. We need to let this book lead us in our emotion. We need to let this book lead us in our home. And we need to let this book lead us in the pulpit. Do you have that book this very morning? Do you have it not just holding it in your hand, not just being able to read it, but do you have it in your heart, hidden in your heart, that you're doing what this book wants you to do? Again, I hope that the lesson has been encouraging and beneficial. But we need to understand that we need to be obedient to that book for it to work for us. If you're here this morning and you're not a child of God, you've not yet been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And again, don't let emotion tell you what to do and how to become a child of God. But we talked about this morning in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, that Jesus leads us in the direction we need to go. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. How do we do that? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That, that's how you become a disciple. Well, then what? Then what do we do once we have become a child of God? If you're here this morning and you are a child of God who has fallen away and are not observing all that the Lord has commanded you to do, you have time and opportunity now to make those things right with your God. If you're here and you either need to become a child of God or you need the prayers of the, the brethren here, that's what we're here for. We're not here to, to make fun of anybody who comes forward. We're not here to, to judge anybody. We're just here to help. We're here to pray. If you have that need at this moment, please come to the front while we stand and while we sing.